after his grandfather on his father's side, a former slave, which his grandfather um, chose to call himself Thurgood when he joined the Union Army to fight against slavery during the Civil War. When the younger Thurgood was in the second grade, he decided his name was too long and Jordan Vincent Thurgood. Their fifth mother, Norma Erica, was a school teacher and an all black elementary his father, William, worked for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad as a dining car waiter, which was considered a good job for an African American man in those days. There was also one other member of the family, Thurgood's older brother, also named Thurgood. Ten year old Thurgood trudges and throws his school and climbs to the table. Son, what's gotten into you? And why are you so late in coming home? I had to stay after school again. Let me guess your big love got you in trouble again. Really? Right now you're the one with the big mouth. Alright, I guess what happened this time. Norma, you know Thurgood is just a high spirited boy. Takes after his great grandfather and all the way here from Africa. The way the folks are, that man was so pricey. His owner had no choice but to send him free. Now, son, go on and tell us what happened. During geography, Fred leaned over to ask me if white children in their schools were as boring as we were. But I was going to tell him I didn't understand why we should be separate. Anyway, I never thought geography would ever be interesting. When the teacher told us we'd have to stay after school because we were talking, he said we'd have to stay there until we memorized another part of the Constitution. Which piece was it this time? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunity of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within the jurisdiction of the equal protection of laws. Do you know what that means? It seems like a long way of saying all citizens of the United States have to be treated the same under law. Good for you, sir. Good. 
Jean, I tell you, take after your great grandfather. I think you're going to know the whole Constitution before you get out of grade school. How about some stuff? <laughs> Of Howard University, a prestigious black institution where he quickly became a top student. One of the other professors at Howard was so impressed with his students that he later found Thugger a job with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, a group dedicated to help helping. African Americans achieve equality. As the NAACP lawyer, Thugger traveled around the country fighting for the rights of African Americans in courts. Sometimes the job was dangerous. On a dark night in Columbia, Tennessee, in 1946, Thurgood and two other NAACP lawyers are driving back to their hotel in Nashville after a long day in court. Woo! That was a good day's work! Yeah, 24 hour girls back to get one of them. I can't imagine what it was like a free picking arresting 25 men for attempted murder. It's the cops who ran the one neighborhood, not vice versa, so not a shred of evidence against any of those defendants. Speaking of cops, we're about to get pulled over. <laughs> As the siren grows louder, Thugger pulls the car over to the side of the road. Three police cars pull up behind, and in a moment, the lawyer's car is surrounded by four white police officers. Everyone out of the car. Now! Excuse me, officer. What must be the fault? We'll let you know when we find it. Now get your hands up. These black boys think that's so smart, but I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of illegal lit for such a car, man. Shaken him up, he returned to the town of Columbia the next week to obtain the release of the last of the 25 accused African American men. In Washington, D.C., on December 9, 1952, nine white men in black robes sat at, at, at high people at one end of the room. The overflow audience includes regular and Henry Barnes that goes to the case called Brothers and Board of Education being argued. Your Honor, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution is a guarantee of equality to black and white children alike. There is no evidence that black children don't have a similar ability to learn as white children. What the evidence, though, does show is that forcing black children to attend separate school hurts them because the teachers them there are not as good as white children. Mr. Marshall, don't you think we have to... We have to recognize certain facts of life that this is how some people want to live. No, it's to accept segregation as a fact of life is to accept that black children don't deserve full equality. The court should make clear that that is not what our Constitution stands for. Inside the Supreme Court, a buyer and a half later. <laughs> I have four announcements in the judgment and opinion in court of Brown versus Board of Education, which, in which young black students have challenged the constitutionality of public schools that segregate students by race. 
Hey, wake up. It's the brand decision. It's about time. To answer the question presented by this case, we must not know the effect of segregation on public education. Today, education is perhaps the most important function in the state and local governments. It's doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he's denied of an opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity must be provided on equal terms. Does segregation of the children in public schools deprive the children of the minority group of educational opportunities? We believe that it does. To separate some children from similar age and qualifications solely because of their race, gender, and feeling of inferiority as to their status and minds, which may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely to ever be undone. And so today we declare segregation to be unconstitutional. <laughs> After winning the brown case, the brown case, there did continue to be legal battles on behalf of African Americans. In 1961, recognizing Calus Thurgood had helped shape the law in the area of civil rights, President John S. Kennedy nominated him to be a judge on the Federal Appeals Court in New York. A few years later, President Lyndon B. Johnson chose Thurgood to be Solicitor General, a high-ranking legal position in the United States government. There is more in store for the famous civil rights lawyer. House Rules Guarded June 13, 1967. A crowd of reporters with television cameras and microphones waits for President Johnson to begin his news conference. It's got to be the Supreme Court vacancy. Wait a minute, here comes the president. Look, he's got their good marshal with him. The solicitor general. I have gathered you here today to announce that I am nominating Thurgood Marshall to become a Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. He has served this country well as the Solicitor General, and I believe he will do so on the Supreme Court. I told him because he deserved the appointment. Thurgood Marshall is the best qualified by training and by very valuable skills of the country. I believe it is the right thing to do, the right time to do it, the right man, and the right place. Now, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> Mr. President, it is with great pride that I accept the honor you bestowed upon me today. I will do my best to live up to it. On the front Supreme Court building, it says equal justice under law. I have entered that body many times and never stopped believing in those words because in my lifetime I have seen that that law can change things for the better even in the hearts of men. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to our play. We hope you learn something important from this play, and we hope you enjoy the show.